On today's episode of The Lucid Lens, there was an absolutely wild report from SCU, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, with some cases I had never heard of, and they displayed some astonishing feats. We're talking about multiple witnesses in the military, radar, and other sensor data, craft exceeding 9,000 miles an hour. We're going to get into that. Also, Matt Laszlo at Ask a Poll has some other round of juicy sound nuggets Sound nuggets? Sure. <laughs> From Representative Anna Paulina Luna, as well as Senator Mike Rounds, kind of going into the different approaches to their investigations into UAPs. We're going to dig into that. Let's go. There's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. Intelligence representative at a high level from the U.S. government is saying publicly we are not alone. Greetings, beautiful people, you marvelous citizens of the planet Earth, and welcome to the Lucid Lens. I'm just a normal guy who was taken by this congressional UFO hearing last year, and I since fell down the rabbit hole watching every documentary, reading every book and document I can get my hands on, and really exploring every facet of this mysterious phenomenon. Hey, did you realize the Nobel Prize winner in physics in 2022 proved the universe is not locally real? Yeah, welcome to my world. If you guys are new to the channel and you like the content, hit subscribe. Thumbs up, thumbs down. But really, I just want to hear your comments. Um, it really helps the algorithm. But also, I want to know what you guys think of these stories and what do you think is really going on out there? All right, let's get into our first story. First, we're going to take a look at these sound clips from Ask a Poll. Um, with Mike Rounds, uh, Senator, as well as Representative Luna. Um, some interesting updates on their current efforts and their investigations into UAP. The biggest concern that we should have is either our very sensitive programs being, um, being opened up yeah. or other countries' very sensitive programs being actively engaged uh, uh, both of which would be of concern to me yeah uh, so so far it's it's a matter of let's make sure that we don't disclose what we actually have capabilities for yeah. in our in our investigations second of all if there are some items out there that are not ours yes <laughs> where are those where are those capabilities yeah. coming from? Which other country no. may very well have them, and what are we doing to counter them? Those are the, yeah, there are, there's always the possibility that we haven't figured out where all of this stuff is coming from. If we can't answer them, those are the two things that I worry about is that we either expose one of our very sensitive programs, or we've got an adversary who's got a very unique one that, that, um, we haven't been able to explain it. With the Pentagon having a nearly trillion dollar budget, like how do they not address this? How's this been well, if it's ours, they may not want to yeah. address it. <laughs> Fair. Okay, so t two things there, right? If it's our own tech that we're, we're butting up against uh, and the, the Pentagon wouldn't want to obviously, you know, show our hand and potential, you know, black budget stuff that we've got. We don't want an, our adversaries to know how far advanced it is. But you think we would at least clue in our own military that we're flying stuff around? No, I mean, and this has been brought up time and time again. We have test ranges specifically for this purpose, unless they're just trying to see how much they can get away with by buzzing our own jets, which... We're not, we're not buzzing our own million dollar jets, multi million dollar jets, tens of million. How, how much does a freaking F 35 cost? I don't know. But that's besides the point. And if it's an adversary, sure. But now there might be some of that stuff going on now, but back in the 40s, I don't think it was our own high tech stuff buzzing at 9,000 miles an hour, right? So interesting. We don't want to you know, tip our hand and reveal our capabilities. That makes sense. Um, but you, you would think that once this investigation opened up that they would disclose to the Congress investigating like, hey, look, this is what this program is. This is what this program is. Don't worry about it. It's okay. You know, 
we'll see. <laughs> it's it, it's it's yeah, crazy stuff. All right. So anyway, this next bite is from Representative Luna. As I think that there is absolutely, without a doubt, something there, and I think the level of pushback that we get is pretty obvious, and yeah. so. I look forward to being able to hopefully get something seriously considered for the next Congress in regards to an actual committee, because I think it should be investigated. Yeah. And you guys can see there's a bipartisan support. Yeah. But, you know, I'm at the point where I've also to, you know, we have a lot of information for people who are opposite, so being used specifically what's uh -huh. accurate, what's disinformation, I think that that's incredibly important. So we're making sure that we're not putting out wrong information or false information to discredit the movement. How would you describe the relationship between Pentagon and the contracting industry. Yeah. Are they like? Have we seen the wedding like Eisenhower foreshadowed? The military industrial complex. I think it's very evident that there's not enough oversight, and that we have to make sure that we're, you know, staying cognizant. Yeah. Sorry, I'm uh, making sure. Yeah. That you have day job. What kind of last question? <laughs> yeah. Are you worried? Cause it, could it be that the SAPs that Russ brought up? are hidden in the contract. Well, and that's exactly why we need more oversight. Sorry. Talking. All right, I'm just going to stop it right there. There's obviously a crowd protesting background. Um, so she basically says the pushback is obvious. There's a lot of information being sent to their office that they want to sift through um, to make sure that they're not, you know, putting any disinformation out there. I'm sure they're getting flooded and I'm sure her, her aides and, um, you know, uh, her staff is doing a lot of research and there's a lot of crap to sift through i'm sure so they want to be thorough with that but she agrees there's not enough oversight they're being denied access to these special apps uh, access programs at the saps uh, but they're staying focused she has not spoken with rubio or anyone in the senate however she has reached out to their staffers and is uh, happy to sit down and have a meeting with them and that's kind of where she's at with that now so we still haven't heard anything about uh, a potential field hearing. I feel like they just got to, they got to be working behind the scenes. I mean, Luel Elizondo tweeted, what, a couple of weeks ago now, this is, you know, the calm before the storm. So these folks are still engaged. You know, people get a little antsy that, you know, no big nuggets have dropped recently, but people just got to be patient. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they can't pull the trigger too quick on things because they don't want to get ahead of themselves. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes and there's an interesting coordination or a lack of coordination between the house and the Senate where they really are kind of leading two separate investigations. You know, they're looking at money. They're looking at these programs. They're looking at, you know, the allegations is this probably an infinite amount of, uh, you know, rabbit holes to dive into. So Stay tuned. <laughs> All right. We got one more clip here from um, from Senator Rounds that we're going to listen to. Do you remember the name David Grush, the UFO yeah. whistleblower? Yeah. One of your House colleagues, House Republican, wants to hire him on their staff so that he can help them with their investigation into SAPs, special access programs. What do you make of that? I don't think there was anything that disqualified him from that. Mm -hmm. We most certainly don't ask the House who they should hire, and they don't ask us. Yeah. <laughs> well, it seems like it's too over here. It just seems like they're doing a full-throated investigation into something very different. Over there, um, looking into like extraterrestrial life or hidden programs, but it seems like over here you guys are very focused on foreign nations, potential drone intrusion, stuff like that, or special development. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, look we, we're recognizing that there are things that are difficult to explain sometimes, and our biggest concern here is the national defense purposes. What are they? Where are they from? And the natural suggestion is, is they may very well be either ours yeah. and adversaries. We do not want to get into a position of um, exposing any one of our very sensitive programs, yeah. but we're not sure where they're coming from. So if the House wants yeah. to uh, include specific language, we try to. Are you read in? Was, was, uh, are you read in on every program? Well, you never know if you're read in on that. But the U.S. contracts, there could be something that you don't know. Yeah, that was that was very interesting. Rounds 
should be written on every program in his position, but he said, you're never written on every program. He may have, you know, the, the proper clearance level, but if he doesn't have a need to know specifically, uh, you know, and then they touch again on the difference between the house and Senate investigations. You know, he mentions, look, those things out there that we don't know what they are or where they're coming from again, like he should know if they're ours, but he doesn't know if they're ours. No one knows if they're ours. Yeah. Some crazy shit. Yeah. I said, said, we don't know where they're coming from. You're never written on every program. The thing, the, I'm pretty sure he asked both of them if they had heard of the Joint Chiefs communication that was sent out this past year. And neither of them had heard of it. Like, sure, an individual congressperson, they have a lot of stuff on their plate. This is one of many issues they're dealing with. I get that. I think this would fall to the fault of their staffers not getting this news to them. Like, hey, you know this big investigation into UAP? Well, the Joint Chiefs of Staff put out a communication to all branches and commands of the military. This is the procedure for reporting. This is what defines a UAP. Don't send that balloon bird crap to Arrow, even though Arrow is still who you send your reports to. So the Joint Chiefs taking this very seriously, and they're admitting that UAP are everywhere. They're not ours. They're not our adversaries. They're not our allies. They're everywhere, though. <laughs> This is wild. This stuff is getting talked about and it's crickets, crickets, like nobody paying attention. Insane. All right. I think we've, we've, we've beat that one to death. Let's move on to this main story here. This is the SCU, the scientific coalition for UAP studies, which published a report on a pattern study of from 1945 to 1975. So 30 years of both military and public activities. I think this is the third report in their series so far. So this, this report is wild. I read through the whole thing. There's a ton of data, lots of um, charts and graphs showing trends over time, both how the tr uh, sightings and, and interactions and activities change from mostly military and daytime sightings to mostly nighttime and public activity. First, I'm going to read through the abstract here, which gives you an overall idea of the entire report. But then I, I cherry picked some crazy incidents that kind of blew my mind when I read them for the, for the first time, because I, I had not heard of most of these. Yeah, they have Maelstrom, um, which was, you know, when they turned off all the nukes. But there's a bunch of uh, sightings and incidents that I had never heard of before. So this paper reviews patterns of reported unidentified anomalous phenomenon in the U.S. associated with specific types of UAP activity observed during the period of 1945 through 1975. The nine specific types of UAP activity reviewed were interactive flight, radical flight, electronic transmissions, interference with military weapon systems, intrusions at military installations, loitering, close approaches, observed occupants, and encounters with an, an occupants. So this was a set of 505 UAP incidents selected from Project Blue Book, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, or NICAP, Clear Intent, and faded giant. The incidents were chosen after a comprehensive investigation to ensure sufficient information was available to characterize the activities and that the incident displayed at least one of the nine specific types of UAP activity being studied. Uh, so during the early study period uh, from 45 to 60, most reports involved UAP being observed at a distance during the day and with both military and public. From 60 onwards, the UAP report shifted to close approaches during the nighttime and with the public. The public domain increases in reports from 1960 onwards included uh, close approaches, occupant observed, and occupant encounters. UAP occupant reports and reported messaging indicate intelligence. However, there are limited data with which to establish strong patterns and trends and further studies required. The military domain activity, which focused on the locations of deployed atomic weapons, continued throughout the study period. Okay, so 
gives you a general idea of what they looked at. They were extremely thorough in this report. Um, they kind of define the nine different types of sightings. And like I said, I'm going to, I'm cherry picked a couple of really juicy ones. I, I want to touch on because they're just, they kind of blew my mind with, you know, the, the amount of people and the, and the credibility of the people and the data and the sensors that they were able to capture the stuff on. So right here, uh, this is uh, multiple UAP interactive flight examples. They give a whole bunch of them, but I just want to call out two of these here. So May 1st, 1952, George Air Force Base in Apple Valley, California, 1050 a.m. An officer plus three airmen on the base arms range, as well as lieutenant colonel at a separate location four miles away, saw five flat white disks about the diameter of a C-47's wingspan. That's almost 100 feet. Flying very fast in a formation of three in front and two behind at an estimated uh, altitude of 4,000 feet. And passing the objects also made a 90 degree turn. So that's, that's pretty crazy. July 26, 1952, Hampton in between Newport News and Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, uh, between 1215 and 1245 a.m., ground air defense spotters observed a brilliant, luminous silver and red and green object hovering over the James Bridge River at about 1500 feet for half an hour. It then ascended towards the east where it was also observed by the Langley Air Force Base Tower. Air Force crews of two F-94 interceptors and additional ground observers also reported four round silver bluish objects in a V formation as they shot straight up and disappeared at 5,000 feet. During those observations, Navy ground radar at Norfolk and additional airborne aircraft also tracked unidentified objects. I mean, that that's insane. Like, multiple witnesses all over the freaking place. <laughs> Well, this is just bonkers. All right. So now we're going to get into radical flight examples, which are, so the first one was multiple interactive. Uh, so basically multiple intelligently controlled, you know, anomalous objects. This one is radical flight examples, which showcase, you know, uh, capabilities beyond what we have. So July 4th, 1947, Portland and Milwaukee, Oregon and Vancouver, Washington at 1.05 p.m., a large number of people, including radio newsman Frank Cooley of the station KOIN, INS Wire Service employees in the Portland, Oregon Journal Building, Clark County Sheriff's deputies, Portland police officers, highway patrol officers and harbor patrolmen all reported seeing five large disks moving together at high speed with oscillating or wobbling motion and making sudden 90-degree turns as well as zigzag movements. The disks they described as aluminum and chromium color. And then on uh, January 1st and 2nd, 1954, in Toms River, Marlton Woodbury, and Surf City, New, New Jersey, between 10.35 p.m. and 12.05 a.m., a Navy pilot, a local police chief, and several police officers, as well as some 20-plus additional witnesses, observed anywhere between three and 12 round or oval white objects with fuzzy edges, slightly smaller than the full moon, hovering in the sky for some one and a half hours. Two objects circled around a third and then switched places with one another. The objects then suddenly departed to the southwest at extremely high speed, growing smaller until disappearing in one to two seconds, covering about 60 degrees of sky. Multiple independent witnesses across a baseline of at least 12 miles resulted in triangulation of the object's distance and height. Later, Air Force scientific consultant Robert Hynek calculated the UFO speed at departure to be in the tens of thousands of miles an hour. Absolutely insane. All right, so this next one... Oh my God, this next one is... <laughs> so, all right, unusual speeds and... Being able to hover is one thing. This this took it to a whole nother level. So this next part speaks about UAP electronic transmissions. So IFF, or Identification Friend or Foe, is an in identification system that uses an aircraft or other vehicle-mounted transponder engineered to detect a coded frequency-specific interrogation signal and then sends a separate coded frequency specific response that identifies the aircraft and vehicle. So it's basically, it's an identifier, but it's in, you know, it's a very specific coded identifier. 
So to produce the correct IFF response, the UAP would need to be configured for the correct interrogation query and to be able to respond with the correct coded response when triggered by a specific interrogation frequency. So if a UAP with advanced technology sent an IFF response, that would be considered a deliberate act of messaging. Given the complex encoded nature of an IFF response, it's unlikely to be either an equipment or transmission error because that would have to be a very specific response. It's not... In the absence of contemporary technology that is engineered to function as a transponder, the ability of UAP to receive and respond to signals using specific frequencies would require the ability to detect signatures unknown to any previous or current technology resources. I mean, that would be like us going to an alien planet, receiving their transmission in whatever form that was in, some foreign language we never heard of, or, or you know, who knows what, I'm sure they don't count in binary, but whatever form their signal came in and being able to be like, oh yeah, we can, we can respond to that. All right, let's listen to this example. So from July 16th to July 18th, 1957, an air defense radar station outside of Las Vegas, Nevada, Mount Lemmon, tracked an extremely high speed unidentified target estimated at 6,200 miles an hour for over a very short time before it became stationary. The UAP remained airborne and stationary for over 32 minutes, apparently hovering at 42,000 feet altitude. The target then departed at a similar and possibly faster speed until it disappeared beyond radar range. During the time the search radar acquired the target, it appeared to respond to an encrypted military IFF transponder signal. The UAP was sent a command to identify itself from the air defense site. In turn, the UAP sent back coded elements of an appropriate IFF response. A similar incident had been reported two days earlier by the same crew at the radar site. The incidents of those two days were unique, with no similar report either before or afterward. Analysis of the event. The object was tracked at 6,200 miles an hour. For reference, at that time, the fastest plane was the Ferry Delta II at 1,100 miles an hour. So... <laughs> way beyond anything we had. The UAP then became stationary for over 32 minutes and transmitted an IFF signal. Combining both the incredible speed and the ability to stop and stay stationary strongly suggests this was not an aircraft available at the time, either friend or adversary. Uh, a speed of 6,200 miles an hour and hovering puts it outside of currently known capabilities today too. Given the fact that the UAP also transmitted an IFF response raises the possibility it was not a radar anomaly and that the IFF transmission was a deliberate act, perhaps a test or potentially a form of messaging. So yeah, it. we said, hey, identify yourself. And it said, okay, I, I'm a friend or whatever res coded response it sent back. Like, how did it know what to send back? In what form? Really? And it's traveling, you know, five times faster than our fastest plane at the time. Then it just hovers for half an hour. Gosh, that is, that is crazy. So this next section talks about UAP interference with weapon systems. And so throughout this report, there were six incidents and they were all atomic in nature. Um, and, and the example that I picked was the Malmstrom. Uh, that's what that fits into this. And this happened February through March uh, 1967. Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana experienced an ongoing series of UAP incidents involving low-altitude unidentified lights. Reports included UAPs hovering adjacent to security gates and missile silos. Uh, on March 16th, two flights, Echo and Oscar, reported an extended series of UAP activity. Security alarms were triggered and armed teams dispatched to multiple missile locations. Maintenance and security personnel at multiple missile silos reported unknown aerial objects in their vicinity, and at least one flight of 10 ICBMs was officially recorded as having unexplainably gone off alert status. There were also persistent reports from Air Force personnel on the base at the time that one other flight had also gone off alert status. The Echo flight missiles were later officially determined to have gone offline due to a control system fault triggered by an extre uh, externally generated signal with an unknown source. It should also be noted that while the missile's wing unit's history notes UAP reports, they were all dismissed, with the unit historian being on record as having been told to edit that section of the history record. 
The only contemporary record of the incidents from March 17, 1967, is a message sent to SAC expressing grave concern because the cause for the missiles going offline could not be identified. Wow. And they were told to scrub the incidents. Why? Wow. Well, I mean, <laughs> the word still got out. Robert Solis uh, shared his story. Gosh, when was that? Back in the early, early 2000s, right? All right. So we've got another couple of examples here. I mean, and you guys really need to go through and just read this whole report. There are some just the data is very fascinating to look through. And there are so many more reports and, and sightings and, and encounters. All right. So this one is a close approach. And on April 17, 1967, four miles from Jefferson City Airport, Missouri at 9.05 p.m., School principal John L. Metz and three teachers in separate cars who were also driving home behind him saw a huge 350 to 400 foot diameter bluish white helmet shaped object come over the Missouri River cliff at an estimated 300 to 400 foot altitude with one directly overhead. It bathed their cars in intense light and hovered over a power line for some 10 minutes before heading toward the airport where two more witnesses also observed it. A 400-foot football helmet? What the hell? <laughs> That's insane. I, wow. I mean, I mean, we are just being visited by everything, apparently. Like, all shapes and sizes. Just, wow. I mean, it's a zoo out there. <laughs> Yeah, so they also go into some occupant encounters, um, which are basically abductions or other, other close encounters. You know, they cover actually Betty and Barney Hill, uh, Travis Walton, which was the Fire in the Sky uh, movie, and, and several others. Um, I'm not going to go through those right now. I mean, just to save some time, but absolutely check them out. And, and yeah, their conclusion is basically... From 45 to 75, we saw a shift from high visibility daylight at a distance to nighttime close approaches and from more military base to more mostly public domain uh, with increased occupants observed and occupant encounters. Yeah, early on, there were frequent daylight observations and multiple UAPs often observed to be disc shaped in controlled interactive flight along with radical maneuvers such as instantaneous acceleration, vertically from a hovering position, radar track speeds exceeding 9,000 miles an hour, and 90-degree turns without changes in speed. And then several reports documented military aircraft engaged UAP and transmitted IFF signals to attempt communications, and the UAP responded with the appropriate communication. Yeah, the coded elements of IFF responses. That's wild. I, I, I'm pretty sure I've not heard that we'd actually successfully, well, we, we pinged them for, you know, communication and they responded appropriately somehow. They knew how to respond to our, <laughs> our request, which is absolutely wild. I, I had not heard that. And yeah, I mean, some ama this is this study was amazing. There were some crazy stories in here. I mean, and everything's been thoroughly vetted and and fact checked. These are most of these from Project Blue Book. Absolutely wild, and and the trends. It, it, it's fascinating how it started mostly military, and they're basically observing all of our nuclear facilities and you know missile launch sites, and but but that the trend went from like daylight observations to more nighttime and public sightings. So what does that say? I mean, is it just more people in the public were looking and paying attention and stargazing and trying to see stuff? Or was there some sort of change in approach from these UAP occupants where they were more or less observing our military capabilities, which those didn't really stop. They went down a little bit, it looks like, but that could also just be because 
the stigma and the position that the military and Pentagon took at that point was, this is all nonsense, stop reporting it. So the U.S. Air Force stopped taking reports after, um, what was it, in 60 or 65? Uh, no, I guess it was 70 when Blue Book was finally closed, right? 69? So after that, I mean, they weren't taking any reports. So everything was shifted to the public. Absolutely wild. So yeah, check out this report. Um, check out Ask a Poll. Uh, let me know what you guys think. I mean, this is, to me, this is absolutely insane. The The sheer quality and credibility of the witnesses and multiple sensors and radar towers. And I mean, from people from all walks of life, we got principals and police and, you know, military and whoever else. I, incredible. So yeah, this report kind of blew my mind. Anyway, go check out the report and let me know what you guys think is going on with uh, Congress. They've got, you know, multiple investigations still ongoing. I mean, they still seem engaged and interested in the, the topic. Skirting around the bush. Is it ours? Is it not ours? I don't think it's ours. We should be right in, but I'm not always right in. Like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> this is absolutely ridiculous that Congress has no oversight. Where's all our freaking money going? Certainly not going to our, our crumbling infrastructure or our... Uh, our medical anyway <laughs> let me guys know what you think about the report i mean the trends are kind of wild i mean i can't wait to see like the next 30 years right uh but yeah amazing report go check it out let me guys know what you think in the comments down below and i'll see you on the flip side